Hello, all you lovely people. Happy fall, good morning, good afternoon, or evening, depending upon where you're joining us from. My name is Damon Hernandez, and I'll be your host with Mr. Ken Russell in our 11th year of the WebGL and now WebGPU meetup event series. On the agenda today, we get the WebGL and WebGPU update, followed by a great lineup of stellar folks with question and answers at the end. So make sure to put all your questions in the Q&A section below, not the chat window, so presenters can answer them before or during the Q&A session. This is also being recorded and will be available with the slides on the Kronos website. Also, send us an email at publicwebgl at kronos.com if you would like to present and share your WebGL or WebGPU work at a future meetup. So we'll take a look at our uh, speakers. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Ken, our WebGL Working Group Chair, for an update. Ken, when you're ready, the floor is yours. Super. Thanks so much, Damon. And hello, everybody. Let's uh, see if we can get this working. Super, we can see your screen. Okay, can you still see my screen? Still can see your screen, you're good to go. Okay, fantastic, all right. So, uh, hello again, everybody, and uh, let's dive right in with some updates from the WebGL Working Group and the WebGL uh, WebGP Community Group. So, um, here's an agenda, uh, which you can uh, study offline. The slides are actually already available at khr.io slash web202210. Um, and first is a call to action for you all to please join the WebGL and WebGP communities. We do this at the beginning of every meetup, but I still want to stress that um, both APIs are supported by vibrant online communities. And if you're using them, we would love to hear from you. On the WebGL side, please consider joining the WebGL dev list. There's tons of announcements of products, uh, demos, new tools, job postings, stuff, uh, questions, any, anything that you, you would like to discuss, everything's welcome. Kronos' own public WebGL mailing list, though, hosts lower traffic spec announcements. We haven't really been using it recently. We're still uh, churning through a dot update, major dot update to the spec. WebGL's matrix chat room uh, gives you a way to talk with the browser implementers and other developers um, in real time, which is great. And you can also find a lot of cool stuff by searching hashtag WebGL on Twitter. On the WebGPU side, if you have feedback on the API, please see the main repository for options on how to communicate it to the community group. There's also a live WebGPU matrix chat room uh, where you can chat with the browser implementers, uh, ask about any issues you're having bringing up your application. And there's also an increasing amount of cool stuff showing up on the WebGPU hashtag on Twitter. So all of us are looking forward to hearing from you. Now, uh, <clears throat> on the WebGL side, we have some general updates. There have been many fixes and enhancements to the conformance suite in the past couple of months, especially in the areas of transform feedback, frame buffer objects, uh, how the frame buffer is cleared between frames, handling of samplers, extensions, and what get parameter returns, a bunch of stuff. Also, um, a bunch of long-running tests were split up into more manageable pieces. Um, thanks in particular to Alexei Knyazev, uh, who's been affiliated somewhat with Kronos, but is also independent, uh, and Greg Tavares from Google for the majority of these improvements. By way of continuing these updates, Chromium's own implementation now finally restores WebGL context that they were lost, and if the application handles the WebGL context lost event. The heuristics for this restoration aren't tightly specified, but it will restore one context every couple of minutes. And if there are more context losses than this, the application will still be blocked from accessing WebGL as before, and you'll have to reload your page in order to, um, uh, to restore it. The improvement here was made principally for Google Meet, which had some issues, uh, seemed unreliable, but actually wasn't. It was uh, the graphics driver. Uh, and also Visual Studio, based, uh, Visual Studio code based IDEs. It turns out that the terminal in that uh, IDE has a WebGL rendering backend, and it's been upgraded to handle context loss restoration. Some of the most exciting work in the community in the working group right now is that Chris Dalton from Rive is developing a pixel local storage extension with the aim to expose it to WebGL. The um, 
the extension is actually the least common denominator among a bunch of different primitives, uh, including frame buffer fetch, uh, shader images. Uh, I think that's the, those are the two main ones. And it basically lets applications do custom blending. And it'll be much faster than the currently available alternative of ping-ponging between two textures for every draw call. It also eliminates the need for KHR blend equation advanced, which never really saw um, widespread uh, implementation. And actually, there's a, there are enough bugs in the implementation that so we didn't want to expose that directly. Um, this will be available soon for prototyping in browsers, and you can follow the linked bug uh, if you're interested in progress on this extension. Uh, as mentioned in the last meetup, the provoking vertex extension provides control over which vertex initiates a primitive. The OpenGL convention is the last vertex. Most other APIs, it's the first vertex, mainly governing the behavior of flat shading. Uh, the, the emulation is expensive on multiple WebGL implementations, and this makes flat shading impractical to use. Um, WebKit's implementation, which was of this extension, which was, was contributed by Alexei Knyazev, is unblocked and will show up in the Safari technology preview soon. We're also aiming to implement this in Chromium soon as well. And basically, if your application uses flat shading, what you should do is query for this extension. And if it's available, it's going to speed things up. So you should use it and set the convention to the first vertex. A, little, uh, a few updates on Engel's metal backend. Work is still ongoing, and this is used by WebKit's WebGL implementation on macOS and iOS, and soon Chromium's on macOS. Chrome has been experimenting with shipping this in the Canary channel on macOS. And the most significant shipment blocker has been an increased crash rate on Chrome's GPU process. This was inside the implementation of GL text image 2D and GL read pixels, and surprisingly, it was only happening on AMD GPUs. We guessed that this was a bug similar to ones previously seen on OpenGL drivers, but the, the workarounds that we had implemented for the OpenGL drivers when ported over to the metal backend, unfortunately, did not have an effect. Um, Jeff Lang, who's the tech lead manager of Angle, studied these crashes and guessed basically what operations in the browser might be causing them. Uh, specifically, he thought that it was snapshots of tabs for the hover pop-ups as you hover over the tab strip. And Jeff stress tested switching among lots of tabs and hovering over them, and he was finally able to reproduce these crashes that had only been seen in the wild. Uh, he found that they were happening when uploading to or reading back from IO surface back textures. And those of you who know what this is, you'll, you'll understand. Um, and he created two targeted workarounds for the upload and readback paths, which have eliminated these crashes. This is a huge relief. So this work has basically unblocked shipment of Engel's metal backend in Chrome. Uh, other uh, important and corollary work, uh, Jonah Ryan Davis and Jenny Amo, both from Google, are finishing support for dual GPU MacBook Pros with the metal backend. And this is actually the last release blocker. As soon as this is working, we can ship and will. Uh, Greg Tavares is fixing some pretty major bottlenecks in GL buffer subdata, which is affecting applications. Uh, Kyle Piddington from Apple is optimizing uniform buffer handling, which is preventing some content uh, unities in particular from running. And Dan Glassenberg from Apple is implementing extensions for synchronizing with external metal events objects. And we're super grateful for this ongoing fruitful collaboration. And now WebGPU and Kelsey will give an update there. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I'm Kelsey Gilbert. I'm one of the two uh, working group chairs on the WebGPU CG and working group over at W3C. And we're super grateful to be able to uh, give this update here in, um, with Kronos. Um, WebGPU, a bunch of you probably already know about it, so we can skip the part about uh, what it's about. Um, I do want to emphasize we are developing WebGPU. We're super excited about it. Um, you should really take a, a second and a third and a fourth look at WebGL and WebGL2 now that you can use those everywhere. Those are super great APIs. Uh, they work everywhere. They're battle tested. And WebGPU is exciting, but it's coming soon. Um, but let me tell you what I'm excited about for it. Next slide. Uh, this is standardization, which is what I'm excited for, but it may be a little dry. But the exciting part is that we're getting pretty close to something we can call a V1. 
we're getting our blockers addressed. We're polishing things up. Hopefully, we're really hoping to get this out in Q4, which is now. <laughs> so we're trying trying to get this out as quick as possible. Um, Wigzel standardization. Wigzel is our shading language, web GPU shading language. Um, we're tackling our last kind of major issues, trying to get things polished up. Um, not to read too much off my slides, but the main things there that we're doing recently are allowing for trap or discard instead of clamping out of bounds accesses, which is a kind of a big change. Um, static analysis pass to prevent data and pointer aliasing issues. So hopefully we'll fix your bugs. We'll tell you where your bugs are before you uh, run into them. Uh, we're discussing how to satisfy function outparam functionality. Um, right now we have a restricted form of pointer types, but there's a ton of restrictions that we have to have on those. We're discussing other alternatives like in out, in out keyword like HLSL or tuple based destructuring. But really trying to figure that out. Um, I'm excited to uh, to get a good solution there and something that works for both people writing the code natively and also for our all of our friends porting content. And then just a ton of clarifications. Like any any time you're like you have a function like for for instance square root square root of minus one like what what does that what does that do actually um you know obviously it's undefined <laughs> on our native apis and so we're trying to figure out how much of this we need to make portable to make sure that um even if even if we miss something in writing our shaders they still do the same thing everywhere as much as possible like portability is one of our really honestly one of the biggest features we offer um in both web gpu and WebGL, and we really want to continue that commitment. API standardization is also trying to finish up. We are working on finalizing buffer ma buffer mapping semantics. So like the little fiddly bits, like we have buffer mapping. We've had buffer mapping for a while. We're trying to sort out the final little bits about um, having buffers mapped with multiple usages. Uh, would you want to be able to write to like have a map write usage on a buffer and also be able to write to it on the GPU stuff like that? We're working on async shader module and pipeline creation, which is kind of a hot topic. Um, always, we don't want you to have to deal with janks coming from compiling shaders and pipelines in the middle of frames. We want this to be seamless. We want it to happen in the background, and we want it to happen in parallel. And so, working to make sure that that that's possible. Um, another thing which is uh, super exciting and new to WebGPU is we're working on a GPU external texture concept. And the idea behind that is you can give it a video source. And in WebGL, what you would do for, for rendering from for getting information from videos is you'd copy that into a, in a, into a WebGL texture and then sample from that like RGB or RGBA texture. In WebGPU, we're trying something new here to reduce the amount of uh, memory bandwidth that you need and really just reduce the number of copies you have to deal with since copies are the real uh, frame rate killer in a lot of places. The idea is that you automatically sample from sample RGB out of these video surfaces like behind the scenes these are YUV sources YUV surfaces and like things coming directly out of the decoders. We want to make it so that WebGPU content can sample from these directly like a minimum overhead directly into your shaders only the sections that you want to access and really just drive down the number of copies. There's a bunch of other stuff too. I don't want to go through it all. Lots of polish. We're excited about it. Um, but also at the same time, there's a lot of work happening, but we're also getting very close. So it's the getting very close part that I think we're most excited about. Next slide. Implementation status. Um, you, not much has changed here. Uh, in Firefox, you can still access it nightly. Um, there's a preference in about config. It's still not really secure enough that we can turn it on by default, but we're really hoping to do that, have it on by default in Nightly at the very at the very least later this year. And we're working hard to try to bring our implementation up to spec and uh, dealing with some of those last minute changes that we have to do implementation work to support. Um, Chromium is doing great, um, if I if I do say so on their behalf. Uh, the origin trial is ongoing. You can publish apps today, see how they work. The API will absolutely break under you. It's an origin trial. That's kind of how it works. Um, we're not breaking the API out of cruelty, but just be aware that we're trying to make our best effort to keep things working. And we know that you'll do your best to keep things working as well. So you can keep trying WebGPU. 
release date closer to the v1 release later standard in the standard this year so really just aiming for that v1 in the standard before we all release and uh we're on our way next slide uh the other th the other super cool thing and nothing big has changed in this recently but it's super cool and i want to highlight it is webgpu also has aspects that can be used outside the browser um, that's probably very exciting for some of you and maybe not as exciting for others. But for those of you who are excited, or reasons it might be exciting, um, you have automated testing, doing things online, you can use it in just your native apps. We have a ton of people who actually like the shape of WebGPU and want to be able to use it in native apps. And we both Chromium, or both Google and Mozilla are working hard to make sure that it's possible. So take a look. Next. Uh, there's also some ongoing. With GPU par Chromium partnerships that uh, I, I hear about, obviously um, that's something you should contact the Chromium people and not me about. But uh, these things are super cool. Um, since uh, since the last update, it looks like Play Canvas's major refactor is either either mostly done or entirely done. So check out the tracking bug, and it's full of merged changes. It's uh, super exciting to see a lot of progress here um, running out in front of our actual release next. Again, resources, uh, we have some great tutorials and we have some samples. Um, the samples are exciting and I wanna give special props to uh, Austin and whoever else contributes to those because they're still up to date, they still work. You can just load them up in Chrome. It's super great to see something like material and to actually get pixels on the screen, which is often the goal for so many of us. Next slide. And again, Ken mentioned it earlier, contributing. This is the time. This is the high impact time. Try the API, give us feedback. We're at the stage of spec writing where we really, really, really want that feedback. And it's hard for us to put out like a general call for feedback, except at places, except in venues like this. Um, if you try the API and there's things you don't like, if there's things that don't work for you, if there's things that are super annoying or you think could be really better, like reach out to us. We're super excited to work with you and try to figure out how we can make these things better. Like we're trying to make an API for y'all, right? So help us help you on this. And other things you can do that would help a lot is if you have test cases where things break, check in with us check in with the Chrome team, check in with the Mozilla team, and uh, ultimately like help write conformance tests. It's really dry, but conformance test means that that test case will never again break. We run these conformance tests on every commit that we push into our browsers and into our implementations. If you want it to work, write a conformance test and it will always work forever. And again, uh, join our conversation on the matrix chats. We have specific ones for uh, WGPU on the Mozilla side and Dawn on the um, on the Chromium side. And we also have the general chat for WebGPU. Please join, please uh, collaborate with us and help us make something really, really cool. That's it for now, I think. Next slide is the end. Yeah, sweet. All right, I'm gonna hand it back over to Damon. Super. Well, thank you so much, uh, Kelsey and, and Ken. Up next, we have Ivan, uh, who will be um, sharing with us some very interesting stuff. And I highly encourage everyone to check out madcraft.io. Um, super fun uh, world builder. I've uh, been playing with it just a little bit, um, but hopefully he'll talk a little bit about that as he uh, hijacks the screen here. And definitely check out their YouTube channel okay. for some very interesting worlds that have been created. So we hear you. And then if you just want to share your screen. OK, I'm here. Perfect. And okay. we see your screen. So take it away. OK, let's start. So uh, first slide, <clears throat> obligatory slide. Uh, guys, if I'm here with basic slides, with basic numbers uh, and uh, without much time for preparation then you can also participate in this webinar in other uh, online and offline conferences uh, you just have to uh, do something in webgl that is interesting to other people please share your experience with the world even if uh, you don't have much time or you are lazy or something else okay so uh, hello people today we are going to play some 
Minecraft. Yes, frame rate on Zoom might be low, but here I have a world. I can go to the tree. I can punch the tree. Collect it and go to creative and increase the render distance. Like here, we increase it to standard Minecraft render distance. And it works in the browser. Nice. Okay. So let's talk about it. I will uh, share a few tricks because the project is big and uh, the most uh, usual state of the project is it's broken because we, we are trying to implement everything that was an original game in, in the modes and some clones of the game. So uh, how will you be, uh, how can it benefit for you? If you are writing custom renderer, uh, I will show you some structures that can help with it. If you are trying to make something that has two million triangles in it, yes, it uh, might help you. And also if you are Minecraft fan, uh, it's fun, okay. So uh, the first thing is that in your game, uh, it's in 3D game, it's usually several geometries. Like uh, types of geometries, each geometry is uh, which attributes do you input into the shader? So uh, in my case, there are several geometries and we will focus on, uh, for uh, simplicity, we will focus on uh, quad geometry. The quad geometry is uh, consists of quads, not triangles. How to render it? It's easy. We just push uh, a number of uh, values, plots, units to the array and it will be rendered. Uh, in my case, it's a uh, center of quad, axis uh, for it, texture coordinates, and some useful data. Okay, uh, the explanation is simple enough, but here is an interesting implementation problem. If you wrote your own renderer, uh, you must know about this thing because like, uh, which drawing method to use. Depending on drawing method, you have to store, you can store different uh, uh, numbers in the array in your buffer. Like uh, uh, if, if you use instances, you can store less numbers per one instance, per one quad, and it will help you if you have a very big geometry. And the problem is that draw race instance is not supported on very old devices, but it's handy and we have to use it somehow. In our case, uh, instances uh, on uh, average world in Minecraft with average uh, field of view distance, it's uh, more than 100 megabytes. It's a problem. If you use draw race, then we will have bigger problem. So the conclusion is use instances. In most cases, they are available on all devices. It's available in uh, WebGL2, it's available in WebGPU, but on some devices on WebGL1, you can just make a legacy update. Like you take your instances and convert it to different uh, attributes format. It's uh, the, the best way right now. So in um, Minecraft and all the Minecraft-like games, there are chunks. Chunks e uh, world divided, but chunks every chunk is uh, loaded by network or something, and it's rendered in one buffer. Because if you don't render in one buffer and you render render every uh, thing uh, uh, not chunked, like that, that will be uh, that, that's what will happen with your processor. Okay, so we have one buffer per chunk. For every uh, block, we store it in this buffer. Uh, we, we cache it together, and now we have a, this problem. If you look in spec.js, we see bind vertex array or bind buffer, set the uniforms and draw arrays. And number of chunks, chunks can be big, about 1,000. Here I open Firefox. Yeah. Some shortcut. Uh, okay. Here I have a world as spawn of some server, maybe. Okay, 
So what do we see here in uh, draw number of draw calls is 500. And if I even increase bigger distance, it will be bigger like 600 or so. And uh, it's not good on mobile devices or uh, on devices with slow video card, something, right? So I want to reduce number of draw calls because right now each chunk has uh, more than one draw, uh, like one draw call or two draw calls because depending on number of materials in this channel. So what can I do with it? Okay. There is a multi-draw extension. I read about it on MDN. It's a very good thing. I, I'm not a WebGL developer. I mean, I don't develop WebGL itself. I look at gel, it's like black box, and sometimes I go inside to view sources. So I saw this extension. How can I use it to reduce the number of draw calls? Hmm. Maybe I can just uh, take all the numbers uh, of, of for which chunk I have to draw how many quads and put it in, in this method. Without multi-draw, I have to do multiple draw arrays. With multi-draw, I can use a single method. It's good, but uh, where where those things go? Where where it went? Because we have a bind vertex array and uniform. We have to somehow remove them to use uh, multi-draw. So for a uniforms, there is a, a well-known method. Like first, we can uh, do uh, one uniform array instead of a single uh, instead uh, of uh, a single uniforms we can just store it in array and uh, the limitation of that is there is a constant max vertex uniform vectors that is small so uh, uniforms are uh, the storage is not big uh, so like if we take every 64 chunks Maybe it will work. Yeah, it, it will possibly, uh, I think it will work on all devices, it's fine. So uh, if you want a higher number, not 64, but something else, I have a problem here. It's on the right side, it's not 64, so I can take any size. Uh, I can just make a texture, put all the data there and uh, ask uh, sampler about a particular pixel of this, this texture instead. Uh, in both cases, we have to add one attribute. Uh, in my case, it's called chunk ID. Um, I store extra data about uniforms per chunk. Okay. So the second limitation is buffer. We can we cannot use multiple buffers. We uh, we have to use one buffer per all chunks. All chunks have to be stored somehow in one buffer. What to do with it? Okay. There is an old approach that JavaScript developers uh, don't use. And uh, I didn't think about it for years before I started to uh, uh, searching for a solution for multi-draw. So we just separate that buffer to many pages, like uh, your uh, low level assembler does, like an operating system does. So we separate it to pages and uh, uh, when a uh, chunk needs 10 pages, okay, it's, we give it 10 pages, 10, uh, some pages are free, we select it and give it to chunk. And uh, uh, what we do instead of a single array, we make an object that uh, takes the arguments and pushes it to the next page if the, if the last page is uh, co uh, currently completely filled, then we take a new page and the store the quad there, okay. So um, we solved all those two problems. Suppose that we can now use multi-draw arrays. Uh, but no, if we use instancing, there is one problem. Draw arrays instance doesn't have parameter that tells uh, that uh, tells WebGL how to uh, which instance is first. So we can draw ranges actually. If we have to use the big, big name extension, WebGL 
if you have to look at web gel multi drawn instance base vertex base instance and those methods <laughs> that's certainly very verbose. And the problem is this extension is not yet available. It's available only in draft if you enable it, and Firefox doesn't have it. I uh, yes, it's uh, it will be good if Firefox developers actually implement the thing. So now we can uh, move, uh, squash like 300 draw calls into one. But does it actually improve performance? In terms of number of object commands, of course, num now number of commands in uh, Spectre.js that you can see is small. But our testing show that yes, we can actually um, get better performance with it. On uh, computers where uh, there is no limitation on fill rate, and uh, when player is not loading extra chunks, and there's, there are no lags. Uh, so on the high, high uh, it's two type of computers we tested higher and of computers and uh, uh, computers with uh, integrated video. It also helped. However, testing by Chromium developers shown slow down on metal backend. I don't know what is wrong with it it's uh, their problem so um, of, of course there, there, there have to be uh, we have to test it more on different devices with more parameters because um, we just didn't have enough time yet. Yeah, conclusion this is highly experimental algorithm it can help you in certain cases and uh, to implement it, you have to make your own memory manager, even if it's basic memory manager, just pushing pages without uh, looking at the fragmentation, at the, how, the, how many fragments are there, uh, we don't care about. So yeah, there are things to be tested, science to be done, and there are important details. Here, static draw parameter, uh, when you create the buffer, actually import is actually important if you don't specify it your your performance will die your performance will die also if you don't use typed arrays pass, uh, passing it to the multi draw also uh, 100 megabytes buffer resize is slow you have to time it right uh, based based on player view distance on for something uh, I also have to make a shout out to great uh, actual games that you can play with many, many players. Worlds for what they implemented their own uh, game with very, the, the, the game actually works on older iPhones on WebGL one. They don't even use vertex or AI objects. That's, and uh, they are performant enough. But if you try to capture it with, Spectre this, you will have a thousand draw calls, uh, it will go down. Um, that's all. Thank you. Uh, and uh, wait, wait, wait. There is one thing I want to share with you. Important. Like the real spawn of 2B2T server of three years ago. This is like what happened here. There was many like lava casts, water, uh, explosions, is our ultimate uh, stress test. So you can under spawn, there is a huge cave. Sometimes there is a lava, water, or something. And all those geometries are full of holes. There are holes everywhere. So even my computer with the top uh, laptop device, it's it's very slow for me. It's like 10 FPS, the same FPS at your Zoom. All because the geometry is really blown up. And I will share you uh, the link to this uh, server to you now. Okay, uh, that's real. Uh, that's everything. Good Super. Night. Damon. Thank you so much, Ivan. And as we get set up uh, for the next speaker, what's the best way that people can get in touch with you? Uh, just through the madcraft.io uh, uh, Yeah, website? we have a Discord. If you have okay. a Discord.madcraft.io and 
you can ask for me there. So. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you for sharing uh, that very cool work. Up next, we have Alexander Rose, who is a scientific software engineer and computational structural biologist. Um, looks like the Alexander does some stuff with web molecular graphics. Uh, so if you can just grab, uh, we see your screen. And so whenever you're ready, sir, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you, Damon. Um, yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll tell you a bit about what molecular graphics are, specifically web molecular graphics. And uh, what it's used for, and um, then something about the, the Moldstar project, um, and specifically like the capabilities and peculiarities of the, the renderer in there. First, let's start off with some examples uh, of molecular graphics um, done, done with Moldstar. So yeah, on the left you can you can see like a, a big molecular machinery. It's a ribosome that, that uh, creates all the the proteins running things in our bodies. Um, uh, but the, there's actually we, we've kind of thrown in a wrench there, a uh, little antibiotic that that stops it from working. So um, it's a little thing, but it can stop the whole big machinery. Uh, and then in the middle we have uh, it's a, it's a model of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 variant we all uh, uh, love to hate nowadays. And and you can see kind of the the spike proteins wiggling around there. Uh, that's what we train our immune systems by taking a vaccine or um, or just contracting it. Um, and then on the on the right there's like a typical a uh, simulation of a, of a protein in, in, in a box of water, some uh, membrane there. Um, and yeah, you can see the water box with some uh, like salt, salt ions um, running around. So um, yeah, how, how can we create those uh, in the browser? Um, so it's just a few words about, about the project. It's like, uh, the scientific collaboration started by Protein Data Bank, uh, two members of it, RCSP, PDB, and uh, Protein Data Bank in Europe, um, and uh, a research institute in, from the Czech Republic. Um, and yeah, the Protein Data Bank is kind of the primary resource where um, molecular structural biologists, when they solve these these molecular structures, the experimental methods, um, actually put put their data uh, for other people to use. Um, and yeah, the project is is um, liberally licensed, just MIT, and we uh, openly develop it on on GitHub. And it was uh, yeah started and still maintained by, by David and myself. So we have quite a few. Um, uh, use, users um, use it for um, for their kind of own scientific resources. Of course, the, the protein data bank sites, uh, so Uniprot, uh, the the EBI, uh, including uh, the AlphaFold database. But it's also used in, in bio, uh, biotech, pharma industry. Um, it's big companies and startups alike. Um, so. The, the project itself, it's a bit more than just the, the rendering engine which I'm talking about today. Uh, there's also like um, oh, ways to help you load um, load the, the actual data um, and, and then do something in an, an application with it. Um, but today I'm just focusing on the, the 3D rendering part. So the, um, aims we, we have is to well display molecular data from biology, chemistry, or material science. Uh, and we really want to to scale from uh, from single molecules, uh, kind of increasingly larger ones, some some drugs, um, like a green fluorescent protein, and, and like all the way to, to viruses and then. Big membrane 
um, bilayers and then some e even larger viruses in, in some um, embedded environment. Uh, and we want it to be fast so uh, scientists can, can um, use it for interactive data exploration, but we also want to produce good, good quality for, for publication and, and communication. So high resolution, anti-lasing, ambient occlusion, and so on. And then, yeah, it should be kind of readily usable. So uh, just, you have some data, you, you load it, and then you can kind of explore, explore it. There shouldn't be like a offline processing step involved this one. Um, but uh, let, let me talk a bit about like, what is the actual molecular data and, and, and how um, we'd like to uh, look at it. So in, in general, um, we're, we're talking about atoms, which are kind of bonds, uh, which are points in space. And then they have all sorts of data associated with them, um, like how, how large they are, uh, what, what type they, they are, um, how well they were like resolved during an experiment, for example. Um, so you kind of can see a, what we call a spatial representation here on the, on the top left. And then another piece of data is like bonds that, that connect the, the atoms to, to form molecules. So those are usually drawn as, as cylinders. Um, of sticks. And then there are also like more abstract representations. Um, we just use meshes for, for rendering. Uh, so there's like a cartoon representation, it's kind of a, a trace through, through the backbone part of the molecule. And then sometimes you also just want to see uh, like a sort of shrink wrap, shrink wrap surface around the protein. To, to see the overall shape um, and where like water or, or drugs may or may not kind of penetrate. Um, and then the, the other kind of big type of data apart from like atoms, uh, like points in space uh, is uh, 3D grids uh, of data. Um, they're they're uh, just regular. Um, and then, but they're often kind of you need to transform them from fractional space to, to actual Cartesian co coordinates. So, about just the multiplication as a matrix. Uh, so, and that type of data can, is often like the electron density from, from experiments. Um, and then we, we want to, to show it as volumes or extract isosurfaces or just slices. So, in the bottom right, you can see. Um, like a direct volume rendering um, of, of something. But so there's just in the mid center, you can you can see something of uh, an, an iron atom uh, of that is much higher density than the surrounding atoms. So that's kind of a nice use case for direct volume rendering. Um, and then, yeah, we, we want to, to color and size um, all the representations by by the data associated with this, the atoms and bonds. And then there, there's often, there's a lot of symmetry and, and repetition um, in, in the data. So we, we kind of want, want to leverage this uh, to speed up rendering with instancing. Um, and, and then another thing about the data is that it, it may change um, over time. Um, or because of, kind of experimental conditions. So you have the kind of the same MISH data, but uh, many copies of it. Um, so we, we want to be able to, to show that kind of data as well. Uh, so we in the renderer, we have a, like a, a very simple kind of scene. Um, it, it's just a flat list of, of renderables or like objects we want to render. There's no hierarchy and, and uh, no um, like automatic transform or, or any anything like that. We, we all handle all those things when needed in, in the application, but not the render. And then like such a renderable object usually corresponds to like a, uh, an entity in the molecular data, like a molecule and which gives us the benefit that 
it's usually uh, something that that's close in space. So uh, it's good um, for for some performance improvements um, like culling or so. And then yeah, those those renderable objects they're like a single primitive type, which I come come to later. Um, and we can instance them. And then we we use uh, data textures for any any material properties. So we don't have any UVs or so. Um, and yeah, we, we support like a bunch of graphical primitives. So one is just triangle meshes. Um, okay. I created a scene with, with all of them here in the top right. Um, so triangle meshes. So we, we can just load them from, from attributes, but we can also load the, the positional normal data and so on from textures. Um, we have some compute pipeline where we actually create the meshes on the GPU. Um, and then we we do like ray cast the impostors for spheres and cylinders, which kind of greatly reduce the, the geometry data we need to send to the GPU. And then yeah, we have basic points and lines, then direct volumes and, and images and some SDF text. So to put some labels on. And then yeah, to to associate um, colors or, or other kind of material properties with uh, with the the primitives and renderables, we, we have a kind of three three IDs. So there's the basic object ID, which is um, just a per draw call uniform. Then you, know, you have an instance ID, which you just use an attribute for, um, and then we have a group uh, ID. Which is you know, so, something custom. It's a per vertex attribute. It, it's not unique for each vertex. So it's a bunch of vertex gr grouped together uh, in that group. Um, but when we're rendering grid data, it can also kind of be the grid cell itself. That's the ID, or or um, it's it's read from from um, a three D texture. Um, and yeah, so let's talk a bit about the kind of raycast impostors. Um, so we we render like screen space oriented rectangles for them. Um, so for spheres, we we just need to um, push two triangles, just four vertices to to the GPU. Um, for cylinders, it's a bit more, um, but. Yeah, com compared on the right here, top right, you, you see um, it's an example of a like a reasonably triangulated sphere uh, that looks round. Uh, you need a lot of triangles, uh, whereas for the for the imposter, you just need need two. Um, and then and the pixel shader for for each um, pix pixel that, that got um, uh, that that made it to to the pixel shader, we, we test uh, whether a ray from the camera to the sphere um, actually hits uh, the sphere. And yeah, and that, that's the, that's super, super helpful. Um, so I put together like an example for um, a, a big molecule with 150,000 atoms, uh, just render the spheres and uh, it's, 10 times faster to create them um, on the CPU side and, and then push them. And it, most likely because it just uses uh, a ton less memory. Um, but in the end, it takes about the same time to, to render them. Um, yeah, well, one, one caveat is so you, you need GeoFrag depths for that. So um, on some uh, older devices, just have WebGL one, and then maybe not the hardware capabilities, where you need to fall back to just the mesh geometry. Um, and yeah, kind of with the the imposters and also the instancing in mind, you know, we can see how far we can push the renderer. So here's a a larger model um, of an enveloped um, HIV captured in, in a piece of blood um, done by the wonderful Surfax software. So it, it's just about 200 objects, but it has 250,000 instances. And then all in all, 
um, over 67 uh, million like atoms or spheres that are rendered. Um, and if you render them actually as, as, as spheres, we, we, we can get 24 FPS, uh, but we can also end up as a sort of LOD, uh, we can create surfaces um, around the, the proteins the, the spheres represent. Uh, and then we, we kind of can double the frame. Um, and yeah, this like, also suggests that if we uh, find some way to add a good LOD uh, mechanism to it, we, we can go to even larger systems, but there, there's no LOD uh, mechanism um, at the moment. And then let's talk about briefly about materials. Um, so it's the, the properties that are associated with the, the group instance and object IDs. Um, so we, we have color, uh, transparency, and then what I dubbed uh, substance, like typical metalness, roughness, and then um, we also added like a bumpiness um, that gives us um, like UV free uh, like bumps. Uh, it can be a nice like extra channel um, to, to show some, some, uh, some property, but also makes the surfaces look less sterile. So just uh, if you want to make nice pictures, that can be a nice thing. Um, yeah, and then the, the granularity of this proper, properties, so they can be per object, per group, per instance, or even per group and instance. So that's kind of how we solve, solve the problem of uh, associating um, like uh, of, of color different instances uh, with different color colors. Um, um, and then, yeah, in, in some cases we, we like don't color from textures, uh, but we, we color from volumes or attributes as well uh, if it is needed. And then, uh, and sometimes simple things uh, simple to implement, uh, also quite quite useful. So, like a good old X-ray, um, view dependent transparency can, can be quite useful. Or just omit light at all, or um, like a flat flat rendering. Um, we don't bend the light through normals. Uh, can be just cleaner cleaner style for some data. And then for transparency. Um, Definitely a, a bit of a problem um, uh, to handle. So we have quite the, the array of things um, up here. Uh, so we we have the the weighted blended um, order determined transparency that generally a good balance between performance and quality. Um, but in some cases, kind of it can have the uh, like a secondary transparent object shines through a bit too much. Um, so we also now, th thanks to Gianluca, we have a dual depth building, feeling, which like really helps with that. Um, uh, and then, um, yeah, both, both of those, they, they need a bunch of um, extensions or, or WebGL2. So we, we also have to standard just blended uh, transparency which from for some angles gives you this this um classic uh, artifacts um oh sorry um and then yeah finally also related to transparency uh how, how to handle back faces so uh by, by default we we just don't don't render them um but sometimes you want to render them, uh, though you can either render them transparently as well, or you can have them opaque, which which gives you kind of uh, for this for some kind of data gives you a nice way to kind of declutter your scene, um, but still look into some kind of pockets of, of the surface. And then yeah, we do do a bunch of post processing, especially the. Ambient occlusion is super helpful to, to look at the structures on the right. You kind of see how much more depths uh, you can perceive uh, like 
smaller structures, like in the top example, I would also, especially for large, larger structures, like um, the virus here in green and orange, you kind of don't really see what's going on on the left, but with uh, some ambient occlusion, you, you see uh, much more of the structure. Um, yeah, well, we have some, some outlines as well, uh, including kind of for transparent objects. So if we, we do an extra depth pass to, to get those. Um, and then, yeah, some, some backgrounds, uh, yeah, put, put your structures into context. Um, and then, yeah, finally, uh, so compute. So we're not only using um, WebGL for, for, for graphics, but for, for some compute as well. So, and the, the aim here is um, to, to take this bunch of um, atoms positioned in space and, and create like one of this shrink wrap surfaces or, uh, or meta balls, um, if you will. Uh, but do it all on the GPU, so it's really fast. So there are kind of three three steps we need to do. Is first we actually need to con convert the, the points in space into some some density representation. Um, so we can we can do this um, by rendering uh, like a kind of a Gaussian kernel um, to slices uh, of a Kind of 3D texture, um, but usually we, we render to a 2D texture, um, just shift shift the, the viewport. Um, it seems to be faster than, than binding layers of a 3D texture. Uh, and so we have a kind of 3D um, volume and then we, we need to extract a surface from it. Uh, sorry, um, we, we do this with the, um, Good old marching cubes, um, implementing an algorithm by, by Daikin, uh, which uses um, histopyramids um, to, to speed up go, going through. So there, the first step is to, to actually find out all, all the, the voxels, um, all the grid cells that are that your surface is, is part of. And then um, for, for those, we create a histopyramid. Um, so we don't have to go through the whole texture when, um, uh, yeah, uh, actually extracting the surface. And then finally, we end up with basically with three, three uh, kind of compressed textures for positions, normals, and, and group IDs. And then we can, we can render those uh, as a mesh. Um, and the final step is we, for, for coloring, we, we want to kind of have a, a smooth coloring, not, not like uh, jagged edges um, a bit between differently colored groups here on the left. Um, so we have a you know, vo volume based um, material smoothing um, that works for colors and then substance transparency data. So we, it goes over um, the three D uh, texture and it kind of accumulates for for a mesh um, or for the mesh positions. It, it accumulates uh, all the color values and, and kind of creates the average kind of property value at, at the points in space. Um, it's a bit costly, but it, it has quite nice uh, effects and and you can actually yeah you, you can change the grid resolution of of the uh, uh, volume you you um, accumulate uh, the colors um, and you can even you don't need to sample from every vertex position you can just like do every third or every six or so that, that helps with speed as well and kind of to put this into into practice, if we, you can use this to, to do real-time surfaces. Here's an example of a, a molecular dynamic simulation data. Um, and it's uh, 2,800 atoms. And we kind of do the three compute steps on the GPU. We calculate the Gaussian density, we extract the isosurface. Now we smooth the material properties. And then finally, we render the mesh. 
And doing it on the GPU is about 20 times faster on, on my test machine than doing it on the CPU. So basically the difference between uh, a slideshow and uh, a real time. And that's, I'm almost done. Um, so a few words about comp compatibility. So yeah, we, we use WebGL 2 when available. Um, we, but we can emulate 3D textures and sometimes we actually prefer to. Um, just, yeah, what I mentioned earlier can, can be faster um, to, to just change the, the viewport, uh, for example, and instead of bind different um, slices to, to a 3D, uh, of a 3D texture. Um, yeah, there are some more fallbacks, so no, no raycast impostors without frag depths and uh, fancy transparency, uh, need a bunch of WebGL1 extensions. Um, for some things, we, we need blend min-max extension as well. Uh, and then, yeah, for really old uh, hardware, if there's no depth texture or draw buffers, so we'll need to do some extra passes. Um, and then, yeah, uh, also looking forward to the provoking vertex extension. Actually, the, without it, some some cases are twice as slow as they ought to be. Um, uh, so that helps. So we, we do one primary case where we use the flat modifiers for kind of GPU-based picking, where we kind of render the the IDs, uh, the kind of group instance ID. To, to a color texture and then read that to, to find out what the mouse cursor is hovering over. And yeah, we obviously need um, uh, need the uh, attributes uh, uniform for that, um, which it, it not always is. Uh, so there are some hard requirements. So we, we always need instance arrays and then element ending sequence and standard derivatives. And um, due to the way we handle material properties, we need um, at least eight vertex texture image units. And a bunch of references um, to study offline. And then, yeah, thanks. And questions are in QA later. Some more um, examples uh, are shown. Uh, in general, you can find um, more info about the project at, at oldstar.org. Uh, all right, that's it for me. Super nice, Alexander. And I take it uh, someone wants to contact you, they can find you through moldstar.org as well? Yes, yeah. Super. And and great way of, um, you know, uh, I, I really have nothing to say because it's so cool uh, being able to visualize these things. So definitely thanks for sharing with us. And so right now we're going to make the, the transition to our last speaker, um, Emmett Lelish, who is um, seems a, a, a jack of all kinds of cool trades. Uh, he's done everything from designing drones for DARPA to 3D printing at Microsoft, invented a volumetric video Kodak at a startup, and now runs the Model Viewer open source project at Google. So um, Emmett, when we see your screen and whenever you're ready, uh, the floor Fantastic. is yours. Thank you so much, Damon. Yeah, I'm Emmett Lelish from Google, and uh, I'm in this talk and uh, talk about Model Viewer, um, which is the project I run open source, and uh, it's recently achieved version 2.0. I'll also talk about the advancements in GLTF recently. I have a lot of involvement in the Kronos group there as well. So this will be a touch higher level. Um, obviously, we make lots of use of WebGL 1 and 2, and I'm sure eventually WebGPU, but um, really the purpose of Model Viewer is to abstract that um, because let's face it there are those of us who love working in graphics and matrices and triangles and gl buffers but there are the vast majority of people who do not love those things and if we want 3d to be everywhere um, we need to make it easier and that's really what model viewer is about so this is our our good old open source web component it's here to you know, give you with one line of HTML interactive 3D, um, but we have improved it quite a bit over time. And so now, for instance, um, you know, we have, for instance, um, pan enabled enabled by default. And I don't know how many of you have ever worked on 3D UX, but it is trickier than it looks. Um, and the fact that we can now, 
you know, for instance, do a, a panning implementation that we can we feel confident standing behind by by making it default is because we can guarantee, for instance, that the camera will never enter the object, right? So you're never going to see the inside of the mesh, the backsides of your triangles. Um, and as you pan around, you're not going to be stuck in the middle of nowhere orbiting some point that doesn't matter. You're going to actually orbit the thing that you're interested in seeing at all times. Um, so we've put a lot of effort into sort of the subtle background UX that, you know, it's the kind of thing where if you don't know that it's working, then it's working really well. And that's the kind of thing we want to make it so that people don't have to think about over and over again. They don't have to rewrite and redesign. They can make use of something that already exists. Um, so this, you know, enabling pan by default was, a, was one of the big features of, uh, of version 2.0 here. Um, this, I'm showing you modelviewer.dev, so of course you can go uh, find all of our documentation here and several of the other slides here. Um, but yeah, I mean, version 2.0, it's a, it's a really big improvement for us. We're pretty excited about it. It's been more than two years since we did a version 1.0, um, and, you know, it was time. Uh, we realized that, you know, a lot had changed, and we needed to finally balance sort of the, the ease of upgrade with the ease of first time use. Um, obviously, we've been very careful um, up to version 2.0 about avoiding breaking changes. We did pack our, our breaking changes into version 2.0, but they're still intended to be easy, you know, of basically a seamless upgrade for the vast majority of our users. Um, but at the same time, making it significantly easier for people who are first pulling out model viewer um, by basically modernizing our defaults, you know, making sure that people are really getting our best experience first. Um, we also simplified our API. We removed a lot of things that people weren't using that were complicating our code base unnecessarily. Um, and a lot of that has, you know, really another goal was to make this project more maintainable, which means keeping fewer bugs, right? I think quality is the utmost concern um, for, for this open source project and really for anything that we expect to be used widely. And you can see in our release notes here, this was a big, um, it was a big update. We did a lot of things, um, lots of bug changes, lots of bug fixes, um, lots of lots of updates, um, but they were all, um, you know, discussed with the community ahead of time. And it really, I think, made it easy for, for people to keep up um, is the goal at least. Um, getting a little bit more into GLTF, um, we've been working in the PBR Next group to add a lot of extensions to GLTF over the last year. And so you can see here, you know, here's an example model that's making use of the sheen extensions you can see for uh, making this sort of velvet type fabric um, that's going to be important for really any kind of material that's fuzzy in a sense. Uh, you get this sort of uh, edge sheen off of it. Um, we're making use of the uh, um, uh, uh, the clear coat um, extension here. So this metal car looks like like a real car with an actual clear coat. So you get a, a, a significant difference in the in the way the reflections work for that. And then finally transmission um, through these windshields. Um, and I'll note that, you know, one thing that we put a little bit of special emphasis into in Model Viewer, um, because we're so focused on interacting with the DOM, with the website, with CSS behind you, you'll notice this, um, this car is in fact transparent right through to the background CSS. Um, and that really, you know, that really means that you can get something that looks realistic and blends into your website. It doesn't have to be just a box with 3D. It can, it can integrate with the rest of, of your site for the, the best user experience. Um, so, you know, we, we work on that pretty hard. Um, and I had a hand in, in implementing those shaders to make sure that we were being as physically accurate as we could while also maintaining high performance. After all, this is meant to work on low-end mobile devices, and it does. Um, you'll notice here, we also have full support for uh, the material variance extension in GLTF. So you can uh, share different materials, different textures with the same geometry. And in so doing, make sure that you're basically uh, not having to re-download a bunch of vertices and triangles that are simply going to be the same for the next version. This is especially important in products. Um, and in addition to that, We've made sure to have um, a full material API interface now. So you can actually, you can get materials um, through Raycast, through clicking, and you can set their values um, basically exactly according to the, the GLTF JSON spec. So, you know, you can set emissive, alpha, double-sided, you know, base color factors, textures, all that kind of thing. Um, and you basically access it in exactly the same way as GLTF is laid out. So you don't have to learn another API. 
Um, that's that's really the goal here is we're, we're trying not to force people to learn more and more game engine APIs, but rather just focus on the standards they're already familiar with. Um, in terms of who's using Model Viewer, you know, I mean, I think a lot of people will say like, oh, well, that's just some open source JavaScript library, that's that's great, but like, is it is it really gonna meet my needs? Is it really that performant? Um, is, it, is it really that reliable? Well, the Google Store has adopted it. You know, here's one example of, uh, you know, the Google Pixel Buds, but the, you can actually find these 3D models in almost all of their products now, and we're busy making more engaging and exciting experiences on these stores as well. And, you know, again, like, they take this kind of thing very seriously, um, and we're busy working that into the into the even the main pages and such, um, checking out all of the metrics, all of the latency, all of the errors, and making sure that that's totally kosher. And you can see by the fact that this has launched publicly that it has passed very stringent quality control checks, which we're proud of. Um, not only that, but um, on the actual search results page, I mean, this was this was a huge win for us because again, like to get a library loading right in Google search. You talk about the absolute utmost in requirements for latency and reliability. Um, not just any library can get in there, but we, we managed to do it. And you can find lots of different educational things you search for. I, I happen to really enjoy this eukaryote. It fits really nicely with the presentation just before, of course. But if you find this, uh, this 3D model here and you view it in 3D, this is in fact model viewer. And I'm especially excited to show this because they're not just throwing up a 3D model and calling it good. They've actually integrated our more advanced features, things like hotspots, the fact that we have all kinds of eventing and the, the ability to easily um, interact with the rest of the DOM, with the rest of the page. And you can see they've done like a really lovely job here of making something that's both beautiful and actually quite informative, um, which I, for one, really appreciate. So they did a fantastic job and I was happy to partner with them. Um, I've also noticed more and more um, that uh, the scientific community has picked up on Model Viewer. And this has been kind of exciting because I don't actually know any of these researchers. Um, I just started having, people started sending me their papers saying, hey, look, I think they're using Model Viewer. And in fact, they are because fundamentally, right? If a picture's worth a thousand words, how much is a 3D model worth? Well, especially if you're working in the field of 3D related stuff, um, why wouldn't you show a 3D interactive model of, of your work? I mean, the idea of a printed paper is just so lackluster by comparison. And so you look at some of these incredible papers that are coming out recently, you know, where they're actually reconstructing full 3D models from just even a single image <laughs> through, you know, all kinds of machine learning. But what's spectacular about this is you say, well, you know, how good is it really? Are you just showing me, you know, the, the good view or something? It's like, well, okay, you know, if you want to know, you can zoom in, you can see exactly where the errors are, you can see exactly how accurate it is. And, you know, they're not hiding anything. They are truly letting you inspect um, to see what, what their results are like. And I think you can get so much more out of this digital version of their paper than you ever could in print. And I find that to be really exciting. And you know the reason they use Model Viewer, I'm pretty sure, is again, it's one line of HTML. They don't want to spend their time as researchers building a complicated website, and they certainly don't want to learn WebGL. Um, but they do want this stuff to just work. So that's what we provide. Um, and finally, there's the we we built a Twitter embed. Um, again, the vast majority of Model Viewer's users are external, considering that it's an open source project. Um, and so we built a tweet generator to help show off their work. So you can actually go here on ModelViewer.dev, and it'll basically uh, walk you through this very simple process to uh, to throw um, uh, some meta tags up in the top of your website so that when you link to it from Twitter, you'll automatically get an embed. I was just amazed when one of our users shared this, which um, went a little farther than what we do by default, but I thought it was just fantastic. It's, it's definitely the same basic experience. You can see, um, you know, Base Bros AR here, but um, what they've done is modified our tweet generator with not only what is an absolutely beautiful 3D model, but also that you'll notice this is the time today, right? It is in fact 1014 <laughs> and you can watch the second hand ticking here. And that's because they've actually animated this model, hooked it in with a little bit of JavaScript to the time APIs and actually set the animation time to 
the real time. And they did this all with model viewer APIs that we exposed. And I, the, the fact they thought of this and did it so quickly and easily um, really impressed me. And that's, that's how I know we've, we've built something that's uh, adequately generic. So um, that's all I've got to show off for now. Um, obviously, please take a look at the release notes, take a look at our documentation on modelviewer.dev. Um, there's a whole lot of features I haven't covered here, but the idea is that this should be you know, able to handle pretty much the vast majority of your single model needs, shall we say. Um, and we're actually working on, uh, on extending that to multiple models shortly. So that'll be the next interesting thing to talk about. Um, and obviously feel free to come to our GitHub page. There's close to a thousand discussions now with lots of answered questions about not just model viewer, but everything related to 3D, um, uh, as well as you can always file issues and bugs there. So I appreciate it. Super great work. Very cool. And very cool that they also, uh, that, that is a neat uh, tweet thing, which hopefully uh, if you can uh, drop that or uh, in the chat, if possible. Certainly, yeah. If you go to modelviewer.dev, there's a link right on the front page to it. Super, super, super. I'd love to reshare that. All right. Well, this is the the part of the presentation where we uh, turn it over to uh, questions and answers. And it looks like we have some uh, questions uh, that were asked uh, that were also answered. But for the sake of everyone in the streams. Um, we're going to go ahead and then uh, just uh, address these uh, for the folks that can't read the chat. So um, the first one uh, that I'll uh, read off here, it looks like it's a newbie question, but it was said a roadmap for WebGL and Web GPU integration with WASM WASI concepts. Intriguing to see the different ideas people have for using WASM in browsers and in runtimes outside of browser environments. Uh, GPU integration via WebGL and or WebGPU, obvious next steps. And I believe, uh, Kelsey, you had a take at yeah. this. Yeah, this, this is a great question. Um, we, and I'm not familiar with all of it, but I do want to say that we are definitely designing um, WebGPU and still looking at WebGL as like with an eye towards good WASM integration. Like WASM integration um, compiled to web kind of things, like super important use cases for us. Uh, in many cases, it just works. Uh, there are JS bindings for these APIs. WebGL, the classic one, is an M Mscripten. In WebGPU, you might have to roll your own in JavaScript in order to connect to your WASM code. Like, you just have to write the bindings yourself. Um, there may be ones that exist already. I just don't know about them. Sorry. Um, I should try to know more about those things. And uh, for non-JS runtimes, I don't know the full answer. Like, if you're trying to run on a non-JS runtime. Um, and with WASM. We have answers if you're trying to run in different, like if you're trying to run in Rust, WGPU is your go-to. If you're trying to run in C++, your go-to is probably um, Dawn from Google. Um, for WASI, like I, I had to look it up briefly. I, I'm not super familiar with it. Um, I'll try to learn more about that and have a have a better answer for that next time. But the definitely the goal is like WASM. WASM is like a first class citizen, like a first class thing we want to ensure works, even if we might not have like direct WASM bindings. Like JavaScript is the answer there. Thanks. So. Super. Uh, can I can I uh, add one more thing? Which of course Just to, to, to underscore it, um, WebAssembly integration for both WebGL and WebGP works really well today. Um, you can write your app in C or C++. You can link against OpenGL natively, and then you compile for the web, and it seamlessly runs on top of WebGL. Similarly, for WebGPU, there's a WebGPU.h um, that you can already compile against natively and link against two implementations natively and then run in browser. Uh, and some of the aspects that we've been working on optimizing in the browser are to make JavaScript to... Um, WebGL and WebGPU calls faster in browsers. And because WebAssembly is just seamlessly integrated with the JS VM in, in basically all implementations, that means that you can get out to the GPU faster and get your, your geometry on the screen faster. So all of these are top priorities, I just want to underscore. I actually had a related question. Do we anticipate that, say, like the C17 
standard parallel algorithms libraries we'll be able to compile into web gpu through inscription someday is that the kind of thing that might be possible eventually um off the cuff i would say that like anything that's in like c plus plus 17 core if you just compile it uh to, to wasm it should just work it should just like dynamically pull everything you need in well it'll work single threaded but the question oh, okay. is will it, will it parallelize to the gpu automatically like it does on uh, regular c plus plus oh i didn't know it did that uh i don't know and it's a it's a great question for like i, I, don't, I don't know sorry it's a cool idea all right Moving to uh, the next question. So it says, uh, web GPUs, GPU external texture looks super exciting. As someone who deals with super high resolution videos, this is very, very exciting. Definitely interested in learning more about how web GPU will be able to sample these video sources without copying them. Yeah, uh, this is just super interesting in an area that I'm excited for um, improvement here. So I'm glad other people are excited too. Uh, the like the idea is really just that you ask for a frame from a video element basically by by uh, importing an external texture I think is the are the words we use for it and then you have access to that frame for some period of time we usually need to give it back to the decoder pretty quick but like you'll be able to pull it in for your frame and in your shader all you'll do is you'll have a, like a sampler external kind of type and uh, on your side in in um, w Wigzel, all you'll do is sample from that. Like you'll just give it texture coordinates between zero and zero and 1.0 and sample from it. And we'll give you the RGB data that it represents. We'll do the color management. We'll do the conversion from YUV. We'll do all that stuff and just give you give you the, the, the answer. Um, behind the scenes, like that's, if that's what you're asking about, it turns into like, we, we get this data in like, YCBCR or like YUV forms. It's not actually RGB. We might get it in like it, the frames might actually be larger than the the contents actually are. So just be like padding and stuff like that. And so in the browser, what we're doing is we actually kind of inject into the shaders the mechanisms we need in order to sample from that, do the right math, do the color matrix transforms that we have to do to convert it to RGB and give you something that like is magic and just like gives you the values. But the idea is, especially for super high resolution textures, like people are using like 8K videos and stuff now. The idea is that if you have like a 4K monitor and you have an 8K texture and you put this 8K texture onto something in WebGL, it's like a big copy. And with external texture in WebGPU, the idea is that you only like you only use the parts that you sample from. And so if it's just like on like um like a screen in a scene somewhere, like and and uses like a hundred thousand pixels or something like that. No big deal. We only do like a hundred thousand samples. It's much much lower impact. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, great. And so then jumping uh, back to some of these that were already answered. Um, does Madcraft support surface nets? Okay, so surface nets is one of uh, techniques to make uh, terrain based based. If you have many voxels, a grid. If you have a terrain, uh, so how to make it smooth, right? Uh, I didn't ever implement uh, this technique. Uh, it, of course, is it something that uh, we want to try maybe later? Like if we may, uh, our our current goal actually our first game on this engine will be uh, science based, uh, like uh, to travel to other planets, do some stuff. Right, uh, and it might be actually good to implement terrain like in uh, uh, No Man's Sky or something. So yeah, we might do it in future. Also, I know that many Minecraft mods, there are Minecraft mods that at at this uh, merchant cube. So and I don't know about surface net, but it added merchant cubes to Minecraft. It was weird, very weird, weird. weird. Okay. All right, and then the, the last question we have about the Minecraft web, what could also be a more general question? Performance is really important, but how do you, if at all, force the use of an external graphics chipset instead of an integrated chipset on a Windows laptop? As this often means a huge drop in performance and Windows tends to use the integrated chipset on 3D web applications. Yeah, so it's definitely a problem. 
And uh, for our game, it's biggest problem because we have a user generated content. And the user generated content can be full of holes or stuff. Or we, we don't know the limitations. So we can just make a general algorithm for uh, to make better viewing distance or something. So it's a problem. And the only thing we can do right now is power of preference high, high performance parameter for context creation. But of course, if we make uh, if we make a desktop version of the game, I mean by just putting it inside some something like uh, not the web kit, maybe was integrate with support of uh, RTX. Um, then it might be possible, but we didn't try it yet. So this uh, question, I want to redirect the question to you guys. Maybe you know something about that, how to, uh, what is the progress of browsers uh, to force on Windows and dual GPUs, MacBooks? So uh, I'll offer one first comment. Um, the work that's been ongoing to make Angle's Metal backend support multiple GPUs is actually all the, the uh, infrastructure for finally making dual GPU support work on Windows. So finally, we'll be able to talk to both GPUs independently, share um, surfaces, the rendering surfaces between them where possible, or like explicitly transfer them between them when you have to. Like for example, you render on the discrete GPU, but the browser's compositor has to pick it up and use the integrated GPU for compositing, okay? Um, and, and all of this underpinning is, is almost done. Uh, we're dealing with the last you know, crash issues and, uh, and, and doing the final testing. So um, soon in browsers that at least use Engle on Windows, you'll be able to uh, access that discrete GPU. A little bit of work is needed on the browser side. So Kelsey, you know, in Firefox, I think a little bit of work will be needed even though uh, Firefox is already using Angle in order to pick up this uh, functionality and use it. Any other thoughts? We definitely have plans here. Um, there, there have been long-term to-dos for us to get this working. Um, we know it's technically possible. It's just a matter of implementation. All you need to do today though is just ask for that high performance mode and power preference. And uh, as we implement it in the browser, like those will start coming online and you'll start to get the actual DGPUs, the, the more powerful GPUs taking over and in integrating with the OS in such a way that it's low overhead to get those pixels to the screen. So we have the API for it. It's just on us implementers and we're working on it. Awesome. Well, that is um, all of our questions and perfect timing all as we wrap up. I just want to say uh, thank you again Ken, Kelsey, Emmett, Alexander, and Ivan for joining us. Um, of course, these uh, recording of this presentation will be available on the Kronos.org website, so make sure to check it out there, uh, tweet all the coolness. Um, for more information on WebGL, uh, you can visit the link there. And of course, um, we'd love to hear uh, what you're working on, so make sure to uh, email public underscore WebGL at Kronos.org. Uh, with some cool projects or anything that you'd like. And don't forget, there is a survey at the end also. So um, until our next meetup in the next few months, uh, keep up all the great work. And thank you to all the speakers uh, for coming and uh, presenting uh, your awesome work. And until then, take care, everyone. See you in the future. <laughs>